So we've seen great success with being able to increase their operational readiness rates, improve their safety, and reduce their flying hour costs. Having that predictability through technology, it gives us that predictability to look forward or somewhat strategically and gauge what parts we're going to need in the future. Really, in my mind, successful support equals mission readiness. The assets ready, it's able to fulfill its mission when it's called upon. Militaries today are turning to new and innovative sustainment models to support their fleets of aircraft. The reasons are clear. With the rise of peer and near-peer rivals, the West and its allies will rely on fleet readiness and aircraft availability in the event of any conflict. But what does readiness actually mean? Diana Mara is Director of Defence Capabilities and Management Issues at the US Government Accountability Office, which recently published a report on the Department of Defence's military readiness in various domains. Here she is speaking at an April roundtable held by FTD, a research institute exclusively focused on US national security and foreign policy. Broadly speaking, a number of the systems that these different services are, are using are aging, that and in many cases they're being used well beyond their expected life, which means they're breaking down more often because they're getting older, and as a result, they can't fly as often. So that, that degrades readiness. We did another report that we issued uh, late last year on uh, mission capability rates across four dozen different air systems. And we found that only three of them met their goals a majority of time over a 10 year period. And about half of them never met their mission capable goals over that entire decade long period. So that, that's a real problem. And that's part of the reason why we're seeing the, the downtick in overall output for readiness in the air domain. Welcome to Shepard Studios' Critical Care podcast, the story of military aircraft sustainment and support in an unpredictable world. We are brought to you in partnership with our sponsor, Collins Aerospace. Over the course of four episodes, we look at the role of sustainment in ensuring fleet readiness consider the part that technology plays in reducing downtime, and hear about the advantages of greater collaboration between industry and the military. And we consider the future, how ever-changing requirements and new technologies are changing the game further. Life cycle support, or sustainment, is key to delivering aircraft readiness. But what does this entail? Here's Craig Brees, Head of Sales, Marketing and Business Development for the Avionics Business Unit of Collins Aerospace. Well, in simple terms, life cycle support includes all the elements of sustainment that support a product, a system, or a platform from the first day of fielding through the day the asset is retired. Really, in my mind, successful support equals mission readiness. The asset's ready, it's able to fulfill its mission when it's called upon. As, as we're talking the military and defense sector, life cycle support is a placement of resources, technical capabilities that ensure mission availability of that system or platform. I mean, it goes from a tactical radio system to a whole platform like a C-130. And these capabilities may include things or a combination of logistics, spares, obsolescence management, the testing and repair of critical components. The key really is that the support needs to be flexible because our customers have changing demands and needs and we need to adapt with those as the platform matures through the life cycle. You know, and one thing I thought I'd highlight that we're seeing lately, an increasing need for an approach that's being pressured by the extended life of many platforms out there. While at the same time, these light, useful lives are getting extended, the missions are becoming more complex and airspace continues to evolve. In this example, 
you know, obviously component obsolescence comes to mind, but also needs for increased uh, capabilities on the aircraft. And flexibility is really critical in this to ensure the mission. But the sustainment approach, and that's why this is a good, good example, needs to adapt. There's repair, but there's also going to be modification and upgrades that may need to happen to those platforms as they age. Building an effective life cycle support plan brings an array of benefits, both financial and operational. First, it's to be sure that the end user has the necessary resources, technical capabilities, components to ensure their operational readiness. It's all about their ability to, to achieve their mission. And that's most important on the first day that the, they may be called on that mission or the last day of the life cycle. Second, it needs to be flexible because this is a dynamic environment like I talked to before, and it changes through time. And third, of course, it needs to be affordable. It needs to provide efficiency for the customer and also as we execute it together based on their needs. There are, of course, costs involved with such lifecycle support. Really, it's the entirety of the cost that's going to be incurred by the user to operate, support, maintain that product, that system, or that platform, which is unique and complex in the military environment because these products and systems are very complex and they operate in uh, severe conditions in many cases. A platform typically operates multiple decades. You know, there's platforms out there that have been flying for 40 or 50 years. And this sustainment approach is critical, again, so that that 40-year-old aircraft can achieve its mission when called upon. Uh, the cost, again, in the military environment especially, really began early on in the product and platform development. Because at that time, we're developing the investments needed in support shops, training, sparing, partnerships to support these platforms around the world. Then once they're fielded, the cost is more around operating and supporting, you know, all the direct and indirect costs for using the systems, having trained personnel, doing the maintenance, uh, investing in spares and repairs, and then potentially upgrades or capability and enhancements along the way. Military aviation readiness involves a range of choices around acquiring new aircraft or reducing support for aircraft that are approaching the end of their service lives. Such choices are highly complex, involving different factors. Here's Mark Kansian, a senior advisor at the Centre for Strategic and International Studies, speaking to FDD. Airplanes are fabulously expensive, uh, but we have to be careful that we don't substitute aircraft that cost $40,000 a flight hour for aircraft that cost $15,000 a flight hour and think that that's going to help our readiness uh, because the cost of these new aircraft, which may bring very important capabilities, is just uh, so high. The other thing that I would flag uh, is a, a caution about reducing support for aircraft that are um, uh, leaving the service. And what I see the services tend to do is that if an aircraft or a type of aircraft is going to leave, uh, going to be retired, they cut way back on the support. And so for those last couple of years, uh, it doesn't have the kind of maintenance and readiness uh, that it uh, uh, usually did. And it can, be, in fact, can become dangerous. And this may have been one of the problems with the Marine Corps CH-53E heavy um, lift helicopter, which had a lot of accidents uh, that may have been a result of uh, you know, at the end of its life, getting we'll cut way back on um, parts and maintenance. Yes, some of these systems are, are incredibly expensive. And I think, you know, they, about the F-35, it's kind of the, the poster child for this. And, you know, we're talking about a life cycle sustainment cost, not just production, but just to sustain that system. It's $1.3 trillion. And the services are at a point now where they, at least with the way the program is currently structured, they literally cannot afford to fly the number of planes that they plan to buy. So resourcing is an important part of all of this and balancing the prioritization between readiness, force structure and modernization is, is, is a key thing. And it's, and it's also very difficult to get that right. 
As in our day-to-day lives, sustainment decisions involve trade-offs. Sometimes platforms see their service lives extended beyond their retirement dates, adding a new dimension to sustainment costs and challenges. Here's Craig Breeze again. In many cases, if these platforms are carefully maintained, upgraded along the way, they're capable of executing the mission. No doubt about it. Now, so the I think the trade-offs that happen is when c- countries, customers, air forces are under budget pressure. So they need to do those trade-offs. Do we procure new aircraft or continue to um, operate our existing aircraft? Um, not only is it a trade-off of cost, sometimes aircraft aren't available in the same quantities as they once were. And it's a really varying story, whether you're looking at fighters, bombers, helicopters, right, trainers, tankers, they all have their nuanced story. But but the trade-offs are, are real, and we are seeing um, aircraft get extended globally, and life cycle support and proactive sustainment is a key element to ensure that we can do that and support the customer. The ability to extend the life of a platform offers significant value to military customers in financial, logistical and operational terms. This is Jason Watson, Head of Operations and Supply Chain at Collins Aerospace. Yeah, the ability to extend life on any product, and I don't think it necessarily has to be um, in the military, adds a lot of value to, to any sort of customer at the end. But I think, you know, when it comes to sort of you know, um, mission availability and mitigating risk and uh, preparedness uh, for our military. Um, Things um, and capabilities might include uh, the logistic support of of parts and material, um, having a really good testing and service centre capability. Um, And behind all that is uh, uh, an uh, engineering support team, which can overall extend the life of parts or all parts of a platform. So as an example, you know, we might be talking about a tactical radio on an aircraft or a helicopter and our ability to have the right products at the right time and turn that around in a sustainable and long-term environment or longevity uh, it is, as you would imagine, very important. For Collins Aerospace and its partners, performance-based logistics, or PBL, plays a crucial role in proving reliability across the board. You know, I've been a part of a lot of PBLs, and when I think about it, it's a name for a sustainment approach that is fully aligned between the operator and the provider, and it's based on a performance outcome that they both want to achieve, right? So it can take on all kinds of different shapes and forms, but the key element is it's an aligned performance outcome that both want to achieve. You know, an example could be a PBL that delivers support based upon things such as repair turnaround time and reducing it, which would allow the provider to seek efficiencies in how they execute those repairs for the customer and allow the operator to ensure mission readiness by having assets on their shelf when they need it. Um, And and there's trade-offs in this, right? And that's why it needs to be worked between the operator and the provider. Um, There's trade-offs between repair locations, repair strategies. Do we want partners to provide things closer to the customer? Does the customer own depots? Those are all trade-offs that in a good PBL are talked about openly. You agree on the outcomes and then how you're going to execute to those outcomes. I mean, we've had great success with our performance-based logistics contracts. This is Mark Ballou, Senior Director for Global Sales and Marketing for Boeing's international government and defense business. And they are becoming more and more prevalent as our customers and operators are seeing that uh, they can go through and have higher operational readiness rates, higher part availability, um, and do it for a much more affordable cost by putting that onus back on the OEM uh, with having the reach back to the uh, parts components, the engineering design, uh, and then with us working through those, we've also been able to go through and use you know, different algorithms and the math behind to say, hey, when do we anticipate these parts having an issue? Are we seeing um, 
new things or opportunities for those parts to have longer lives and those types of benefits. So we're seeing a significant amount of benefit from the PBL. Uh, it's also helped us with some of the things that would could be considered an issue. If you've got obsolescence issues or if you've got con- challenges with uh, some of your suppliers going you know, out of business, doing different types of things if there's not sufficient throughput or work to go through with them. So that's all been kind of the benefits of having the PBL for us is how are we seeing, where do we have some of those challenges with maybe a supplier that uh, needs the throughput to be able to keep their business going? There's going to be an obsolescence issue. Uh, how are we getting ahead of that and then kind of seeing what those uh, monthly demands are? Because it's not always a, a consistent demand. We're going to need this part this month to be able to go through and do this. So having that longer term PBL, being able to work through all the things that are going on with that, we've been able to really highlight, identify where those parts are going to be needed. What's kind of the throughput on the shelf we're going to need? Where do we need to have things stocked at location wise? So it's really been beneficial. So we've had some really strong successes and in, in with the PBLs. At Collins Aerospace, the company uses historical data to help ensure parts availability, a crucial advantage in delivering performance-based logistics. Here's Jason Watson. I think it's our ability first to get it in into our services quickly. Um, having the availability of the on-site technicians to do the work. And as I mentioned earlier, on having the parts availability. So you hear of a lot of operations and um, companies that will say, yeah, we offer this performance-based logistics, but we've got to go and order those parts. So having that predictability through technology um, and forecasting, you know, some of the, I suppose you use a bit of historical data um, where we've had issues on certain platforms, it gives us that predictability to look forward or somewhat strategically and sort of gauge what parts we're going to need in the future. I think I'll give you a good example where we've probably done it in the past and I'm probably going to have to be a little bit generic here. So an example with the Australian Air Force, uh, we were installing uh, at one of the um, um, bases um, in New South Wales, we were installing some flight simulators and we had a number of projectors come over from the US and, and out of that, that batch of projectors, um, a, a number of the projectors had problems with um, their power board cards So normally they would have sent that away into the US. There would have been a three to six month turnaround. We analysed um, the problem, liaised with our our business over in the US, understood what parts were needed. Um, We were able to bring those products down into our service centre facility in Lane Cove, repair them and have them back into the uh, the, uh, environment in a bit over a month. So normally, I would say that that's a good example of performance-based logistics. So not being prepared for it, but being able to predict what was required for the quick turnaround time. PBL contracts can also help operators deal with the unexpected, a key demand for militaries. Yeah, I'd say it's all about being proactive. I'll, I'll give you examples of what can be done. First, you need to recognize it. You need to decide you're going to do something about it. And then things like firming up your demand with the supply base, right? So they're not counting on speculative demand from you, that they're counting on firm demand is a key one. Um, Then putting in your orders and trying to shorten the lead times as much as you can because you put in that firm demand. And then, you know, best practice in industry is buffer, buffer stock, right? Because the more the supply chain can do to protect that end user, the better, right? So whether that's buffer stock at the tier one supplier, that trickles the buffer at the tier two supplier. I'd say those are a couple of examples of of what you could do to try to protect the end user. Yeah, you hit on a couple of the key things there, really. The integrated communication, how are you talking with what your subs are with us, with what the operator is going to be, what do they need and say, hey, we're seeing this, we're having uh, an increased requirement for a number of parts components and we're seeing some maybe some uh, some issues with the supply chain there. How do we get in front of that? Um, And there's multiple ways that we handle this. And so it's not always a standard or a PBL for one country. One of the advantages to the Chinook, which is part of what we've talked about here, is there's 20 operators around the world that are operating them. We have a a good handle on who's got parts components and what location. Uh, If we see one country maybe having a need, hey, they've had a couple of 
of issues or they've got some challenges finding this specific part? Can I reach out to a different country and say, hey, I need to do a borrow payback type of thing to meet our PBL requirements? So by having some of that uh, good communication going on between us, our suppliers, and then the countries that are operating the aircraft, we're able to say, I've got a need in this country. Can I can I use it from, to, to use your two countries, can I take a, a part that would be on a UK Chinook and use it on an Australian Chinook um, and be able to make that happen? So that ability to have interaction and discussions uh, with those customers and our suppliers makes a big deal. In military aviation, requirements can change for all sorts of reasons. Performance-based logistics provides a creative solution for a range of evolving needs. When, when That's why I said a performance-based logistics is a name, right, of a creative solution. And I promise you, of the ones I've been a part of, everyone, when you take off the PBL cover and look at how it's executed, is customized to those frameworks. And, and, it's, and, and when you look at them, if done well, It has the appropriate terms, language for the outcomes that can change. Um, I've seen them with things like demand bands, that if the demand is within this window, the PBL looks like this. If the demand changes in that window, the PBL changes like that. Um, I've seen it change with, um, let's say the mission is flying to one country, and then they need to fly an incremental mission to another country that maybe there's flyaway kits. There may be agreed amounts of every line station or every um, operations base. If the customer wants to choose, we can support it and we both agree on what it's gonna cost to support it, not knowing what or where it may be. It's all about having that trusted relationship with the operator and with your supply chain, putting together a framework that allows for flexibility and achieves that outcome. And these outcomes can be very different from program to program and based on whatever equipment you're trying to support out there in the field. Like all aspects of customer support, performance-based logistics contracts rely on a strong relationship with the end client. I'll tell you, some of our most successful, most successful PBLs around the world There's probably two things, two attributes that they have that very commonly. One, they do take time to get in place because to do it right, you need to have a very transparent and good relationship with the the operator and the provider so you can be transparent and, and make decisions on those outcomes and how they're achieved. That's probably one. And second, they're, they're very often is embedded personnel. And they can range, I've seen it range from kind of flight line personnel that help troubleshoot at the aircraft level to, um, I'll call it repair engineers that live inside the depots and help with the component repairs uh, to logistics personnel that are there. And, and really, it's where, where can we align and where do we want to where do we align and where does that end operator need support to get the outcome we're after? Performance-based logistics and similar concepts have long been utilised in the commercial world. Companies such as Collins Aerospace seek to learn from the civil domain. I've done a lot of time with commercial customers and military customers, and it's great because the execs on both sides ask questions and best practices about what the other side's doing. Um, first, I'll say from a technology perspective, the, the military is really looking for those products that are ready off the shelf and gain the benefit from being developed in the commercial market. Um, that, that's one thing, as well as anytime you have that lar- larger install base of a product across military and commercial variants, it does give greater um, scale to the to the the product. What does all this mean in real terms? Take the CH forty seven Chinook, in service with more than twenty countries around the world. The versatile helicopter recently celebrated the sixtieth anniversary of its first flight. Today, operators use a variety of support contracts to maintain both the airframe and the mechanical components 
but also critical subsystems such as the common avionics architecture system, known as CAS, and the Digital Advanced Flight Control System, or DAFIX. Here's Boeing's Mark Ballou again. With having 20 countries operating the aircraft, you know, the, the 60 years of flying it around the world, because we delivered the first one in, in August of 1961. I'm a Chinook guy by trade, so that's my background. So uh, I didn't start flying them in 1961, but I've been flying them since 1987. So, <laughs> but, uh, but that is a huge, it is a huge difference because we've had them in every environment, whether it be high sand, whether it be over salt water, whether it be an extreme cold, you know, uh, the aircraft will, it, it operates exceptionally well in every type of environment, but those environments have different types of impacts on the on the maintenance of the of the platform. So we've got information from all those. How, what should you do to operate it? How do you prevent corrosion? How do you go through and work in the high salt? What do you do for extreme cold? We've got information to do that. We even have sensors on board the aircraft that can say, because you have different skill levels of the pilots to, as well as an experience level. Uh, we're able to take some input from the control inputs that the pilots are making and say, hey, based on doing this, you're going to increase you know, the damage to this type of part or component. So you can make adjustments to some of the flight procedures parameters. Uh, you can get information to say you're operating in a, in a high sand environment. These are some of the, we've got information from the aircraft to say by doing these types of landings, whatever else are gonna increase the damage to the aircraft. So make these adjustments and it helps us put different sensors on board the aircraft as well to, to minimize those. So a big portion of the F model was going to be the, the CAS cockpit and the DAFIX, and the, certainly the DAFIX, the Digital Advanced Flight Control System, being able to make those inputs, put you in a stabilized hold. It helps increase the safety of the crew. It helps increase the uh, the success of the operational mission that you're going to perform, and it reduces the amount of damage to the aircraft. So uh, having that kind of experience, having that much data to be able to help you, not only does it help us minimize the work that's going to be required to maintain the aircraft, we can also give inputs to the pilots and the crews to be able to say, you're going to be able to perform your mission more successfully, more safely, and you're going to reduce any impacts on the longevity of the aircraft. One major Chinook operator is the Australian Department of Defence. This is Colonel David Phillips, Director of the Cargo Helicopter and Unmanned Systems Program within the Australian DOD. So because we maintain, I guess, our sustainment program effectively in-house, so we're not in a situation where we have contracted an industry supply to maintain a particular level of availability apart from our situation with Collins. So, you know, it, it falls back to our, our, our sustainment teams, obviously, you know, to, to look at various sources of information, both our own operating experience and reporting that comes back in relation to our fleet, uh, plus the United States Army is a key source of information for us. And also, you know, we're involved in working groups with other CH-47 off operators. So we, we look at, um, you know, their experience, what our data is telling us, um, you know, that's, I guess, where we, you know, we then have to make decisions in relation to if we have a system or something that's underperforming on the aircraft due to age or obsolescence, then we, we make a determination about, well, what options are available, uh, you know, what represents value for money. Uh, and also as part of this, you know, we also have to, um, you know, engage with Army, who is obviously ultimately the owner of, uh, of the capability. So I guess that's where we might differ a little bit in some countries' constructs, sustainment, the sustainment program is not actually delivered by Army by working the capability acquisition and sustainment group, and, and we have the responsibility to deliver um, the sustainment program for Army. So we have an agreed plan between Army and um, the capability acquisition sustainment group, and it sort of sets performance levels, I guess, through in that sustainment program, and, um, and then that, that's how the arrangement works. Uh, as part of that, Army also has a program, um, you know, that seeks to ensure, um, you know, alignment of our fleet with the United States Army uh, and also looking at making sure that our fleet remains operationally viable because, as you'd be aware, you know, obsolescence can be both material and, and operational depending on the operating environment. Such sustainment work reduces the need for unnecessary expenses in both time and money. So I think, again, um, there's something happening in the sustainment program um, uh, you know, is it in that we need to make a change or, you know, something has happened in relation to a particular supplier or equipment manufacturer, it's up to our team, obviously, to make an assessment, you know, sort of first of all to understand is that particular issue applicable to us, understand the time frame around, well, if it is applicable, you know, how do we seek to, um, 
you know, what time frame do we have to incorporate it, it in? And then you know, once we understand that, we then make determinations about, well, in, in conjunction with Army, how do we then um, feed that particular change or, um, you know, if, if, it's, if it's a replacement part or something like that, you know, we then sort of have that engagement. That, that's just part of our core business. So, you know, the examples of that is, you know, if we have some sort of alert safety information from an OEM, our engineering team, you know, makes the assessment on that, determines is it applicable if it is, understands the urgency and then obviously working with the army will seek to minimize the downtime on the aircraft if we can align it with a, a scheduled activity then we will and obviously you know in the most extreme cases if, if there's a very um short time for incorporation then you know that's we'll convey that to the operator and then seek to um you know achieve that outcome uh, it's the same with you know if there's modifications or enhancements to the airframe that we need to do so as you would appreciate, some of those are driven by the operator to meet operational requirements. Some of them are driven by supportability issues. And again, that's where in managing uh, the fleet program on behalf of Army, again, we would consult with them to determine you know, um, the most appropriate time, um, you know, to incorporate that. And obviously, with, again, with some modifications, uh, depending on the scale, you know, we would seek to schedule that with deeper maintenance activity. So when the aircraft is already in a state of disassembly, so as to reduce the downtime availability, uh, um, downtime unavailability, and also the amount of resources and uh, and workforce that we need to be expended uh, on that. And again, the same with um, another example: aircraft maintenance policy. So obviously. The, um, you know, again, we, we look to um, the US Army as they sort of set the policy, but then how we seek to package it and, and execute it. Again, we would look to sort of see what is the most um, appropriate time, both to ensure the airworthiness of the aircraft, but also, again, not to um, impact substantially on the unit's um, operating ability and the availability of the aircraft. So that's how, I guess, we sort of work through those issues. At the end of the day, you know, I, I, you know like any organisation, we're resource constrained. The most important thing about the aircraft, it's got to be available. Well, um, and so therefore, you know, we'll always seek to minimise downtime where we can. Uh, and also, you know, where we need to incorporate those changes, we'll look for the most, I guess, efficient and value for money proposal or option in which to incorporate it into the fleet. Militaries and their industry partners must be prepared for changes in operational scenarios. So, uh, again, we have uh, no systems available, I guess, within defence that we use in relation to how we manage our inventory and, and obviously understanding what the capacity of suppliers, turnaround times and so on. Obviously, um, Army as the operating organisation will have particular requirements and readiness um, uh, requirements that they need to satisfy. So, you know, those are all the things that, that our staff need to consider and manage to ensure that there's um, there's sufficient parts and so on available in the locations that Army needs and also then our ability in the event that they were to deploy, in particular to an offshore environment, how we would then plug into or feed into the, 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 um, the resupply system, you know, to support them in, in the deployed environment. Militaries must weigh different factors when developing their sustainment plans. Perhaps most obviously, they must ask whether it's better to sustain the life of an older aircraft versus buying a new one, when the newer platform could offer lower life cycle costs. However, when it comes to aircraft like the Chinook, it can be a complex choice, as Mark Ballou explains. We're talking about an aircraft that's been in the, in the service for 60 years. So uh, now, again, it's been multiple upgrades throughout that. But there's you're going to have to do that as technology advances, as capabilities advance, as requirements do. You're going to have to do the modernization upgrades to the aircraft. Uh, anything that you buy in 2020, 2021 uh, that's going to be operating in 2060, it's not the exact same platform. It's going to have a lot of capabilities, a lot of similarities, but you're going to have to do some upgrades to it, whether it be uh mission boxes the black boxes are going in some of the different capabilities all that's going to have to be done uh for any platform that you're going to go through and buy um, it does get more expensive as you've got you know 15 years on an aircraft you've got you know cracks you've you know you've flown it into crazy things you've done things with it. you're going to have to go through and maintain it so it comes down to that trade-off of do i go to uh, the next generation of that same platform and the advantages that go into the same yeah, you know, the next generation of that platform is you've already got some of the training things in place. You've got simulators in place. You've got ground support equipment. You know, you're making those uh, commonality things that are going on. 
Uh, and certainly if you look at the Chinook, um, it looks pretty close on the outer mold line for what it is. So those work stands, those types of things are going to be already in place. If you take one that's, you know, it might have the same configuration number, but it's a vastly different aircraft. You're going to have to buy new stands, new work platforms. Are you going to change the blades? All those types of things. How do you go through and work that? So the countries will make that as a conscious decision to look and say, can I go all new? The, the cost of the aircraft plus the cost of the support equipment plus the cost of the training. Uh, or do I go with, and modernize or upgrade to the next model of, of an existing platform where I've, I can save some of that cost and I'm doing differences training is more cost effective than all new training. So all those things are part of that configuration uh, discussion and what's going to be your benefit to your budget. Of course, a military's choice between a new platform and an upgraded aircraft will be guided by budgetary needs. Done well, sustainment can be a cost effective option. But even here, there are different questions. For example, should a Chinook operator move to the CH-47F model? And again, that comes down to, frankly, in certain parts of the world, color of money. Do I have money to go buy all new or I need money to go do MRO? Can I do some of that upgrade work in my own country? So all those things are, are part of the decision process that a country will go through. And we've shown great success with, uh, you know, again, since we've been talking Chinook there, uh, doing both, both some of it be just do a, a remanufacture. You come in, you, you inspect the entire airframe, you fix any of the cracks, corrosion, that type of stuff, recapitalize some of the dynamic components and put them back in and go. Uh, the F model has been, let's go to an all new airframe because the, you know, the A's, B's, C's and D's, the initial airframes were built in the sixties and they were flown into the two thousands, but they had upgraded materials. So the F model has an all new airframe easier again, where do you have cracks? How do you strengthen the airframe in those locations? And then recapitalize a lot of the components on that. So that's been a cost-effective decision at times. And, and you're able to evaluate where does it get to be that turnover point to say, if I remanufacture or you know redo these parts components but use the same airframe, where does that cost point is? And you can do the math of where does it make sense to go to a new aircraft versus a remanufactured aircraft. So it depends on the, the age of those platforms. What else has been operated around the world? Um, and a perfect example could be, hey, the U.S. military or U.S. Army is going to go to the next generation of this Chinook. So if I go and buy the same thing the U.S. Army is doing, then I get the cost savings of economic order quantity. I get commonality with those parts. I'm not fighting the obsolescence issues that I may be fighting if I've got an older platform that's no longer in service. So talking with the the, the countries, the operators, the customers to say, hey, here's the value mapping of this. It says it might make more sense for you to go and do the new F model versus doing the upgrade to the D model, those types of conversations. So we, the opportunity to go and have those conversations with the customers is critical to the success for them as well as us, as well as our supplier. So what's that holistic talking point? Many providers of sustainment and support have customers around the globe, and they must consider the unique demands of particular regions. For example, Collins Aerospace is considering how it can provide more localised support in Asia-Pacific. Here's Jason Watson. Again, talking about performance-based logistics and the ability to adapt in, you know, uh, for, in time and operational readiness, at the moment, you know, a lot of the parts and OEMs are repairs and that are done out of the US. So, you know, what we're seeing, and I suppose as we look towards the future, um, it'll be about how to we, we provide, um, you know, that expertise into the region. Um, you know, given I haven't spoken much about our service centre capability, but we've got some highly trained technicians on site here at Lane Cove. Um, working across, you know, the distributed aperture system, the processing projectors, and in our service centre. So that's not to mention a couple of our field technicians um, that work out on site. Um, they're actually embedded in some of the uh, RAF operations. So again, it, it provides that ability to address a real-time issue. Collins Aerospace offers domestic sustainment support for its customers from facilities like its Love Cove base in Australia. This local approach provides real practical advantages to militaries. One of, one of the challenges I think for a lot of people um, out in this region is, is, you know, where they send a piece of equipment away. And I, it, it's it's about, you know, some of you hear of the term no fault found. So 
they can pull a particular radio off um, a platform, an air platform, the CH47, um, thinking there's a problem with it, and it may go, have to go back um, through a lengthy um, process to get repaired to find that there's no fault found. And I spoke earlier on about some of the initiatives we're working on with the Commonwealth at the moment about, you know, and it's particularly one of these platforms where, you know, even at a lower level, can we get that platform come into our lane code facility, you know, we're in, in Australia and we can test whether there's no fault found, thus turning it around back to the customer much quicker. Um, obviously, if there's a fault found and it you know, the radio is encrypted, it has to go back into the US. But the number of no fault found we find with, you know, um, radios and that going back to the US is, is sort of would help the customer immensely. But I think like anywhere in the world, in the region, each region has its idiosyncrasies and that um, no fault found is probably one is a really good example. Um, but, but I think adapting to those regional idiosyncrasies ensuring you've got the parts or the OM parts available um, play a big factor in, in the overall performance-based logistics and the relationship with the customer at the end of the day. I think if you get their platform back and working rather than sitting on a, a tarmac not being able to fly, you know, three months earlier than what they predicted, um, you can see the, the bond between the customer and Collins Aerospace is, you know, ha has a long way to go forward in terms of, you know, well, not a long way. We're a long way down the path um, in sort of enhancing the value we offer that customer. In the next episode, we'll look at how sustainment has changed over the years with a focus on digitalisation and other new technologies. For now, let's turn to Jason Watson and Craig Breeze for some final thoughts on the advantages of technology and the evolution of life cycle sustainment. A lot more of the customers are focusing on what they specialise in and they're outsourcing uh, these areas of specialisation or, you know, subject matter experts. So technology plays a huge part in that as we move forward. Um, I think, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with the term vendor managed inventory. So it's where someone like Collins could manage the inventory on their shelf uh, for a particular platform or a particular um, part and then predict, again, a predictability about what parts are needed in that particular region to sort of uh, look forward um, and address any sort of sustainability um, requirements going forward. Yeah, that, that, I think technology plays a huge part going forward, especially around, you know, warehouse management systems, understanding where the product is, being able to move it in and out off the shelf in time, not only externally, but into our service centres, you know, our ability to sort of move product off the shelf into our technicians and have them working within an hour or two, um, you know, lends itself to, you know, timeliness turnaround. Yeah, it has changed. I think as, as aircraft systems and solutions have become more integrated and more complex, that's driven change. And that change, I think, can be in the solutions needed to support it. And this, you know, just to operate it gets more complex. The, the solutions to support the operation then get more complex. Um, the true technical nature and integrated solutions drive a level of sustainment need. Um, and then it goes back into the back offices, right? Whether it's into the MRO stations and the, the test equipment that's needed to repair the products, all those digital solutions that are coming to, to bear to proactively predict maintenance events. It's really an exciting and evolving place right now. Next time on the Critical Care Podcast, we look at the digitization of sustainment and how industry and the military are embracing new technologies. We also consider the role that modifications and upgrades play and how this impacts sustainment and fleet readiness. That's next time on the Critical Care Podcast. The Critical Care Podcast was produced by Shepherd Studio in partnership with Collins Aerospace. A huge thanks for their support. The Critical Care Podcast was produced by Tony Skinner, with research and interviews by Damien Kemp, the scriptwriting by Jared Cowan. 
Until next time.